Thus endeth the tale of the murderous monitor. So Becky's repaired speaker has developed a crackle. And before I alert her of it, I want to see if I can fix it because, uh, you know, she's real proud of that. She's got every right to be. I thought we were sunk. And so I need to determine if, if, uh, there's a problem with the monitor, and my suspicion is, having just picked it up and heard this, that something's dangling loose in there. Which makes sense, because a crackle is indicative of more of an electrical problem than, than a physical problem with it. So, uh, let's take a look at what we got here. Does that fit? Yeah, it's stripped out. Okay, yeah, no. That's dangerous. I wouldn't call these screw holes, and they're not in good shape. They're pretty stripped out, but for what they're holding in, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, I could putty them. Could just go with bigger screws like Becky has. What are we looking at? I can already tell something's busted in here. see I don't think you can see but uh, uh all right so it looks like we got a couple transformers here one air core one iron core and they were zip tied on And they were attached with uh, hot glue. You know, let me see if I can light that up for you. One of my trouble lights here. You can get a good look at it. I'll just slam things right into each other if that helps. So if you look here, we've got an air core transformer and an iron laminate core transformer. And they're just hanging free because they were previously hot snotted in over here. This looks like it was repaired again. So, uh, you know, when you work with old equipment, there's just sometimes you see some stuff and you go, I don't know about that. This is one of them times. But I'm going to guess that vibrational energy because it's a speaker, is causing those transformers to, sit, to shake, which is what's given us our, uh, what's given us our, our crackle. And I love this. This looks like something I did. And that is not a compliment in this case. But what else are you gonna do, I guess? Are you expecting it to break? But uh, I'm gonna try and pry this out. Maybe get it on the slab and uh, see what I can find. This should all come out. And let us behold what we see. This is quite the repair. There's really nothing holding that down. There's nothing holding this down.
There's nothing holding that down. Yikes. All right, let's get this on the slab. All right. So this three ohm resistor has been replaced with a four ohm resistor. This eight ohm resistor has been replaced with two 2K resistors and a eight ohm resistor. That's interesting. All right, this is a 2.3 millihenry air core, but it could be kind of an inductor. It looks like a completely bridged eight, uh, air core thing here. Got a 33 picofarad, no, microfarad electrolytic cap, radial, and three one amp or one ohm resistors wired in series into, I am guessing this is a capacitor. I can't see any labeling on it because I think they hot glued to it, but it is on the board 10 microfarad, but who knows what that means. So I think I can't really do much other than basically redo what the previous tech did and just secure this stuff down and hope this takes care of it. Um, but this seems pretty stable. This needs to be reattached. This needs to be reattached. And this needs to be reattached. I'm not like, I want to look at the underside of this. I'm not, for some reason, I have the feeling that I can't try quite trust what I'm looking at here. And the cap says TI. It's probably not the TI I'm thinking, but who knows. Put it in your view here. Everything looks pretty solid on this end. I'm not seeing any cold solder joints or, or anything that's bad. I mean, with components and, and, and holes this big, you'd know, right? RSL speaker systems, 1989. Why do you have to be RSL? Seriously. Actually, that's probably not this video. That might be foreshadowing for you, but who knows. Um, all right, I'll go get the zip ties and the hot snot. But if there's nothing I really need to play with on this side, I'm just gonna reattach it. Or, nope, I'm gonna leave it unattached so that I can access both sides. So I guess now would be a good time to start Getting rid of some of that, uh... Oop. One of the many, many uses of isopropyl is that it'll undo hot glue pretty easily. It also smells funny. Kind of really got to get it on there, though, if it's going to do the job on something like this. There we go. Schematic said air core, not hot glue core. All right, I don't know how much you missed, but I've been adding isopropyl to this board to remove a whole bunch of, as much hot snot as I can easily do without desoldering, because I don't really feel like doing that. Now I'm enlarging uh, a hole on the board 
so that I, uh, the zip tie is more, I can put a stouter zip tie in it. <clears throat> Could I use the drill? Yes. But the possibilities for catastrophe increase with power. So, all right, that passes through there. And similarly, this will pass through here, correct? Correcto, all right. Well, I let my hot soldering iron heat, or my hot glue gun heat up, and then I had to turn it off so that, um, <laughs> so that I could fix the camera. And the camera was like, ah, repairing file, which means I'm going to get like eight seconds out of that file. You know, I kind of wish, maybe this is something I could turn off, that it wouldn't try to fix the file for me and let me try to fix it myself. Because I suspect I would have a better time with FFmpeg than GoPro's own stuff. You're telling me you spent $600 on zip ties in 2021? Yes. So, more hot's not. I'm gonna do the edges, see if that works. Probably not. And I don't have any canned air to do rapid cooling on this. Redoing this board is not outside the realm of possibility. There's not a lot going on with this board. But I'm thinking maybe the 2023 budget might have some room for uh, new monitors. Not, not next year, but the year after. Now that I'm beginning to feel like this station's gonna have a future because other people are involved and interested and wanna do things, I feel confident thinking about what might happen, you know, three, four, five, ten years down the line, which is a good feeling to have, let me tell you. I don't think that's going to stay. I want to zip it tie. I want to better attach it to the board. But then again, I don't. I kind of want to leave it as is. But everything is staying put now. Or before it was all moving around. I'm guessing because it was the more bassy tracks that it created more crackle, giving me the idea that part of the problem with this crackle was Becky's repair. But I'm thinking more bass means more shaking, more obvious shaking, um, means shaking electrical connections on this thing, means snap crackle lame. So if I were thinking about what I was doing, I might have sleeved that. I technically still could. But I think I might just shove a chunk of plastic in there or something. I don't know. But this is looking a lot nicer than it was when I first pulled it out. So. If I sound gravelly today, I might have done some screaming last night. I mean, not as much as the guys behind me, but... That guy was... That guy sound, sounded like, the guy behind me sounded like his throat was bleeding by the end of the night. Not that I blame him. 
I introduced a little bit of board stress, but I'm not too worried about it given that this is, you know, construction of the board. I'm more interested in making sure things don't move. All right, it's fixed. Let's, uh, let's go plug this in and see what happens, huh? Okay, so we're gonna wire this speaker outside of, uh, outside of its box so that we can test it independent of any system. I've got my spare working amp. <clears throat> Wire this guy in. Wire him in mono. Because, yeah, that's what we're testing. Okay, that's that. Did I grab a USB cable? Of course I didn't. I was able to actually pull the audio interface from my, lap, my, my workstation. Um, because I use pipe wire now, so taking out my sound interface isn't horrible any longer. Which is a big bonus. So if you're a Linux person and you're considering your future with pipe wire, I, uh, I'm a big fan. It's, uh, it has many improvements. I was never a Pulse Audio fan. Uh, if I were a less polite person. I would be one of those people constantly complaining about it. Um, but, I mean, I didn't have to run it, so uh, what's the big deal? For me, anyway. And, and my computer's still being a doof doofus. <laughs> I'm guessing there was a firmware change recently or something, because it was working fine on my test, uh, on my test system. <clears throat> it's working fine for a while. Well, this is dumb. I grabbed the wrong cable. Hang on. I briefly forgot that sound cards are duplex devices. I'm not a smart man. All right, so I had to run out and get a few things, but they're here now. And given that it's the Pacific Northwest in November, it's already dark. Let's see if we can make a crackle, huh? Front, right. Front, right. Front, right. Front, right, front, right. I think it's the front right. If I don't do it now, I have a feeling it won't get it done, you know? Anyway, the video ended there because a whole bunch of people came in and, uh, uh, they weren't involved with the station, particularly, because we had a fundraiser that night. Uh, the first kind of major KTQA fundraiser that we ever had. And so I had to stop what I was doing and move on to that. Well, suffice it to say, the repair, uh, such as it was, actually functioned quite well. It's now several months later. That was recorded in November. It's now February. And the monitors are working great. Now the amplifier they're connected to is has a little bit of a crackle because they need the pots either need cleaning or replacing, but that has nothing to do with the uh, with the monitors. Once you get you know you tap the the amplifier a little bit and it's fine. But I'll have to yank that amplifier out and uh, replace those pots at some point. But uh, Becky's repair worked. Um, I'm actually surprised. I, I wasn't certain it was going to function, but it did. And uh, it functions well. It sounds great. Um, I don't know what an audio file would think, but uh, 
I don't think about that too hard very often, no. Do I? Um, well, after that, the next video in the series was going to be the saga of the UPS. And I recorded tons of footage, like eight, nine, ten hours of footage of me testing UPSs, wiring up batteries, rearranging the studio to put the UPS in. And frankly, none of it was that interesting. Especially since the UPSs that uh, uh, I, were, I was working with ended up not working. So these were a couple of uh, episode. I kept calling them episode in my head. I don't know why. But episode UPSs, which were more for home theater than they were for like like data or infrastructure things. Um, but they were basically repackaged rack mount trip light uh, UPSs, which are a fairly good brand. Uh, I, I've worked with them before. Um, so yeah, I didn't worry about it too much. Uh, I went to the local battery shop, bought some replacement batteries. Uh, wired them in. That took entirely too long because battery packs tend to be a little bit fiddly uh, when you pack them yourself. Um, and then, uh, and then I went to plug it in and I looked at the plug and they looked like 20 amp plugs that somebody wanted to plug into a 15 amp circuit. So I just took some pliers and took that side thing and went eh, and straightened it up. Now it's a now it's a 15 amp plug and plugged it in. That was terrifying. So I replaced those plugs um, and charged up, you know, the batteries had a charge and the UPS seemed to work. And so I wired them all in and I went home, came back the next day, everything was offline. Um, as it turns out, the UPSs couldn't charge the batteries and it caused the UPS failure. Both of the UPSs were broken. Uh, they were fine for my friend Phil. I, he's, I'm very thankful that he was keeping an eye out for uh, for parts that I needed for the studio, but ultimately, it didn't work. So um, I took them over to uh, uh, my friend's house. You know, we looked at him on his bench, uh, looking for anything that was obvious, like a busted MOSFET or something like that, and. Uh, Whatever was causing it not to switch over the charging circuit wasn't in something obvious. It looked like it was something in the logic. And at that point, there's not, not a whole lot. Repairing it was likely to be expensive. So we set those aside and I went to uh, one of my recyclers and I found a couple of decent power, or decent UPSs. UPSs that were I was pretty familiar with. APCs, uh, not the greatest reputation these days. But um, one that would suit the, uh, the rack really easy. And then another one uh, that, was, um, that was also built for home theater, but it had like specific circuitry for analog gear, uh, had a front panel display, and had delayed startup so that you could have things start up all at once. In other words, kind of perfect for this particular uh, this particular use. And so I bought them, uh, managed to negotiate a fairly good deal, plugged them in and they work great. So now we've got UPSs. One of the things that I forgot to mention is that the death rattle of that transformer in the last episode was a power conditioner in the broadcast desk that was dying and needed to be replaced with the UPS. So that's why it happened here is because other hardware had failed. Uh, while all of this is going on, we did sound treatment in the studio. Uh, as you know, as you may have heard while we were working, it can get pretty echoey in there. And uh, and so we needed some sound treatment. So we recorded some of that, and you're probably looking at it right now. What we did with the sound treatment in that room was rock wool wrapped in burlap. Uh, given that Tacoma is a, is a port city, uh, coffee bags are just generally available. You can find them all over the place. And then rock wool we got from... Uh, uh, you know, the big orange store. These were recovered from my home studio. Uh, these were at the Studio Baskin Atheist from 2014 on. Um, it was a project that Sharon, Becky, and I did. And they work really well. And we were, you know, converting the old studio into, into a different purpose. And so having sound treatment in there didn't really work anymore. So let's reuse the sound treatment we have rather than buy new sound treatment. Um, fact of the matter is, if I were doing sound treatment now, 
I would literally just buy RLX phone this time because uh, it is significantly cheaper than it was uh, when I first outfit the Ask an Atheist Home Studio. And so, uh, you know, we had to kind of come up with something creative there to keep the costs down. But these days, like articulating mic stands used to be incredibly expensive. So for the home studio, I repurposed Ikea lamps into microphone stands. They worked great. But nowadays, uh, the cost it took to make an articulating microphone stand out of a uh, out of an Ikea lamp gets within, like, a few bucks of just buying an articulating mic stand online. Because, you know, podcasting and stuff like that has gotten a lot more popular these days. A lot of people want to give it a shot. So there's gear generally available that there wasn't before. So, you know, we, uh, so I just actually bought regular articulating microphone stands. And if I had to start from zero, I'd probably do the same thing with RLX. And that happened in, uh, in early December. And then that was basically it for studio work for a long time. Um, everything that happened after that was more uh, radio station centric stuff. Uh, it was a lot of programming, a lot of technological stuff that doesn't video very well. Um, and we were implementing a new schedule. The first schedule for KTQA that I had nothing to do with. That was done by the KTQA team. And I was helping with them, them with that. The way they wanted to do it required some software changes, so I had to work on the software changes. So that had really been my focus after we did the sound treatment. Uh, and then once that was done, I could then turn around and, and come back to working on these videos. So that brings us up to date. Frankly, there's not a whole lot going on in the studio. Um, what's next is uh, a lot more software changes, but we do need to finish the, the microphone table. Um, we do need to get the five volt logic in. And uh, um, I'd like to actually put a distribution amp in because I forgot to do that because I wasn't really thinking because you know how it is, you always forget something. And so there's, there's some revisions that need to get done. And so the studio, I mean, it works, it's in use. We uh, A lot of stuff is being recorded on it now. This is a functional community radio station, but as you know, no project is ever really done. So uh, that's where we are as of uh, Valentine's Day 2022. And while I'm wrapping up, I'd like to thank my patrons. Uh, here are the people who have helped me out uh, recently, who are keeping the lights on, as we used to say, and uh, helping me keep this community radio thing going. Um, so thank you, patrons, if you'd like to go to my Patreon. Uh, you know, there's a link, I guess. Um, and that's it for me. I think the next thing I'm doing is uh, getting back on the Ask an Atheist horse. One last time. Talk to you later.